Thank you, Aaron. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm a dairy farm kid from northwest Wisconsin. Uh, always dabbled in agriculture throughout my career. Uh, even though I left the dairy farm at 18 and uh, went on to college, um, I've always kind of come back to agriculture either part-time or, or full-time in some cases. Um, raised some kosher veal for a while. I've operated a 4,500-acre ranch in Wyoming. Um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, the farm I ran for 13 years started out as a conventional farm, and over the 10 years period of time, uh, we took it to 3,300 acres of pasture and cropland. Um, and I didn't know anything about marketing. So I contacted my predecessor at NF Organics, Tim Ennis, and he helped me market uh, organic corn, typically uh, anywhere from 20 to 40,000 bushels of corn a year. Um, I had upwards of 100 plots that I had to keep track of organically, of crop and pasture land. So I know this uh, business, I guess, from the side you people are on. And uh, over the past five years, I've worked to help members of NFO market their organic grains. Um, as you can see, if I turn to the next slide, at the end of 2016, the USDA said there were 24,650 organic farms or processing facilities certified uh, to uh, operate in the system. And it was about in 2001 or 2002 that NF Organics got started uh, marketing for our members. And you can see that growth through 2016. So what that means, whoops, went too far, is that uh, since that 2002 time, it's probably been an over a 300% increase in the number of operations that the USDA and the NOP are responsible for keeping track of. Now, NF Organics, as I mentioned, is a part of NFO, but we are also a member and one of the stronger supporting members of OFAR. Well, what is OFARM, you ask? Well, it's an umbrella farmer-owned cooperative that has five or six members up there, and we cooperate with each other. So anything above that uh, blue line there is uh, some of the areas we cover. So from Montana to Ohio and as far south as Texas and um, Arkansas, one of our organizations is working at helping organic growers uh, market and sell their organic grains. And I personally work with people from Montana to Ohio. So, And by definition, uh, any organic grains and oil seeds are identity preserved. Now, this is uh, something you will also see in non-GMO crops. Uh, if you're trying to sell them for a premium, they talk about identity preserved products. And they typically are specialty product. They have high value and command some type of a premium um, for growing them. Here are some familiar names that within the last probably five or six years have become more and more involved in the organic structure. So uh, some big names that you wouldn't think necessarily might be involved, but they are in that they bought up companies that uh, probably started out as a small mom and pop operation, something like that and they've been absorbed by these large companies. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, what those companies are worth, um, there are some figures there that kind of tell you 
that uh, organics has become more and more important in the U.S. economy, and there are a lot of big name companies that are interested in it. And that is being driven by the public. They're saying they want to know where the food is coming from, they want to know their farmer, this type of thing. And they're telling these large companies what type of products and uh, what grains or what uh, products are used in them. So they're the driving force behind this. There are people out there in the industry and some of these companies that feel that organics is the future of American agriculture. Earl Schweitzer, as you can see, is the executive global grocery coordinator for Whole Foods Market. They're a very large multi-million dollar industry with 400 stores and there you see what uh, the com consumer is demanding. Um, and because of that, sales from 2010 to 2014 of uh, non-GMO products, which would include organic, has grown over 400%. At the same time, conventional food products have only grown at a rate of 2.5% per year. That's why he made this statement. No longer are we only concerned with what we produce here in the U.S. For the past three years especially, there has been a growing uh, pressure and import from foreign countries. Um, something that started probably, I noticed, back in 2014, uh, where uh, people that I was trying to sell to would remind me what the current price of that product was on an imported basis. Well, it was in 2015 that they started to expect me to match that import price, and since then um, have gone beyond that, where at times the domestic price can actually be lower than what the um, lower than what the import price is. But it just gives you an idea that this is no longer uh, just a market in the U.S. It's a worldwide market. A lot of these other countries are also getting involved in the production of organic food. So um, what you do is not only affected by your neighbors here in the U.S., but what's going on in the world around you. Um, Costco had said that the biggest challenge is sourcing enough product, enough organic items. So, and they want a consistent supply. Um, the organic market is unique. At this time, there is no futures market uh, for organic grains. Uh, there are some other problems. There are organic grains prices published every two weeks. The USDA publishes a report, uh, organic grains and feedstuffs. You can go out onto the USDA site and see what it is. But part of the problem involved is if they don't get enough price reports from people like myself, the mills, whomever, there isn't a price printed. So um, that can be a problem in knowing what is my grain worth at the farm. Um, so knowing the, finding buyers, knowing the price to ask is a big um, challenge for anyone involved in farming. I market for Charlie Johnson. He and his brothers, some of his sons, now operate uh, about 2,800 acre farm out in uh, Madison, South Dakota. Um, but Charlie is always somewhat dumbfounded and a little bit upset. Not any of his product that he raises to sell stays within his home state. So it's all shipped elsewhere. Um, so this is part of the problem of being able to know where to take that grain uh, once you've finished growing it. So um, I market their grain and their cousin's grain um, out of North or South Dakota there. I might just add my footprint, even though I cover from Montana to Ohio, the majority of what I sell comes from Eastern Dakotas, 
Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. So, I also market for Carmen. He's presented here at Old Grain, I think last year. Uh, an excellent uh, organic farmer, been doing it for, I believe, 30 years or so. Um, but he is estimated that if he didn't have me working with him to market his grains, that he conservatively, to do a good job, would take 15 to 20 percent of his time to do what I do for him. Um, most of the time, well, all of the time, anything I do involves a contract. So it shouldn't be just written by the person you're selling to. There should be some input from the farmer producer or your marketer or whatever to make sure that uh, it works somewhat in your favor too. And there is a farmer's guide out there to organic contracts uh, by flag. It's called the seven rules of contracting. But the number one rule to always remember that the contract always favors the person who wrote it. I have times when people ask what I do and I tell them and they say, oh, so you're a broker. I take offense to that, nothing against people that are brokers, but I prefer to say I'm a marketer and I'm an agent for my producers and the products they produce. I carry their best interest in mind. I like to say I'm employed by NFO, but I work for my farmers. And Charlie Johnson always says if a professional athlete or an actor can have an agent, why shouldn't you? Marketing considerations. It isn't like the field of dreams. You know, if I build it, they will come. If I grow it, they will come. Before you grow it, think about where am I going to sell this product? Where am I going to market this? You know, where, how close are my markets? You know, do I have nearby markets of uh, farmers involved in organic production, such as uh, dairy farmers, uh, poultry producers, uh, people involved in egg laying, that type of thing. Now, I mentioned contracts already, uh, making sure that the buyer lives up to those uh, items that you laid out in the contract process. Before I sell to anyone, I check their credit worthiness. Do they have the ability to pay uh, for this grain upon delivery or shortly after delivery? Um, there's a number of ways to do that. I, I of course, have an account, or I had a finance person that if they're a big company can do it done in Bradstreet. But even if it's your neighbor or a farmer not too far away, um, you've got to have the ability to explain to them, especially if you haven't done business with them, that you need to know that they're credit worthy, that you're going to get paid. And you can do this in a polite way. I can always use the excuses. The piece of people at the corporate office make me do this. Um, if you're marketing yourself, you don't have that option. But I think you can explain it as just good business practice. I don't know you, sir, ma'am, and until we just develop this relationship, I need some other um, source of saying, are you going to pay for the, for the product? And so I ask, do you have a bank or uh, agricultural finance institution that you work with? And if they say yes, then you have to say, uh, would you have that person call and contact me? Or, you know, can you tell them that I will be calling for a credit reference? Now, it doesn't take much. You can tell them uh, the amount of the contract. And uh, if I do this deal, do they have the ability to pay for this amount of contracted grain? So it isn't that you're trying to delve deep into their uh, credit background, but just that you're verifying that they have the wherewithal to pay for that product. Um, probably 95% of my growers that I work for, maybe a little higher percentage than that, I handle the logistics. Um, many of them 
may not have a farm truck, may not have it licensed properly to go beyond that 150 mile radius. We may be shipping this thing, this grain, or three states away. Uh, I think the farthest I've ever shipped is uh, North Dakota on Durham wheat to North Carolina. So you have to know where and how to find shipping for this product because most of the time that is your responsibility. And of course, I check the credit worthiness, but I also do collections. So if for some reason they're slow at paying, despite all my efforts, I'm the one making the phone call asking why and when that's going to be um, paid for. Some of the mistakes made, um, I think by everyone in marketing, not just people new to marketing, um, is believing that the cost of marketing, what it takes to get that done, um, doesn't cost you anything, or that someone should be willing to do this for me at no cost. That turns a lot of people off when I tell them there is a fee involved. Um, so when you do this, though, you should also figure how much of my time is that taking. That should be added to the cost of your grain. Um, you should really include that in your cost because that's truly what your grain is worth in, in addition to the shipping costs. Um, there are a lot of grain specifications. They may vary slightly from buyer to buyer. Uh, how much foreign material can be in there, how much other grain can be in my grain, um, those type of things. And one of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of people make is not getting a representative sample. And what do I mean by this? As you're unloading that grain truck every five, ten minutes, whatever it takes you to unload, you should be taking your coffee can and dipping in there not just go in there and scoop once. If you're in the bin, you should walk around the bin and probe to a proper depth and combine any samples you're taking. Um, why is this important? Well, if you don't represent it properly, and this is especially true in the food grade market, that load is more than likely going to get rejected. Well, what happens then? Well, your marketer, if you have one, turns out like me with a lot of gray hair. But they have about three options. Uh, you can bring it back home at additional freight costs. Uh, hopefully, they, your marketer maybe can find a different sale site and sell it organically yet. Um, sometimes I've called around uh, locally where the grain is sitting on that truck and found a certified organic facility that we can store it in temporarily or, and this has only happened once in five years, I sell that grain on the conventional market. So um, it's very important that you represent any and all of your samples uh, in a manner that really shows what it is. So. So things you have to um, really think about is, do you have something that can be contracted to sell? Or you can sell, if it's a smaller amount, can I sell it to one of my local farmers involved in organics? You know, what volume do you anticipate? Um, if you're raising organic corn for the first time, you know, typically if you've transitioned, hopefully your fertility has been maintained. Um, depending on the area, Rule of thumb, I figure about a, probably 100 to 150 bushels to the acre. Uh, soybeans, if your weed control is good, uh, you should be able to get 35 to 50 bushels to the acre. Um, how can you protect yourself if something goes wrong in terms of uh, the whole deal that you're involved in? Again, contracts is one way. And uh, of course, lastly, getting paid as rapidly as possible. So that's a process that can depend on how quickly the buyer pays. That has uh, varied from buyer to buyer, 
and it seems to have been varying in favor of the buyer. Um, I just got notice from a buyer last week that typically we try to wrap this all up in about 30 days time from the time it's uh, put on the truck until I can get the scale slip back, invoice the buyer, and give them 10 days to pay or what have you. So try and wrap it up in 30 days, but more and more we're seeing buyers that want 30 days. This particular one wants 45 days. And uh, so it just seems that the industry is, is moving to have more time to pay for the product. Um, that could be for a number of reasons, but it's something that to me set up a, a red flag well, are they having financial troubles that they have to extend their time period out? So it's something I'm checking into uh, to see if that's... Typically, if you work with a farmer-owned cooperative such as NF Organics or any one of those five on that sheet I showed you, they're five and a half to six and a half percent of the gross sales. Um, now what I do is I send you out a marketing agreement and I ask what your grains are, tell me about them, what price do you want at the farm? Once I get that farm I go to work and then it's my job to A find you a market, B to get at least your price, more if I can, and then my fees and the trucking are added on top of that. So what you tell me you want and what it goes to the mill for are uh, two different numbers. If somebody says there's no cost, uh, then they aren't being truthful with you. So um, just to let you know that there are other people that think marketing agent may not be a bad idea. Um, this is Nate Lewis, he's one of the head people at the Organic Trade Association, um, and he just says that if you're not familiar with, if you haven't marketed grains organically, it might behoove you to consider an agent. This is kind of a price history of organics. I know back in that uh, 08, 09 era, I was, organically farming. Um, not only did we have 4,500 acres, we had 1,350 head of cow, calf, red Angus. So we were very busy. <laughs> but in that 2009-2010 uh, era, I had, I don't know, 15,000 bushels in the bin. I think I was still marketing myself. I advertised it all winter. Never got a single call. Well, I finally put it in the paper for $4 and it sold in two days. So I may have undersold myself, didn't know at the time. So I started using an agent. Uh, 2011 and 12, if any of you remember, 12 was the drought year. We saw some phenom phenomenal prices on um, organic grains and that's continued through 14 into 15. And during the 2015 to current, we've had more and more influence of imported grains on the pricing of organic products. I mentioned this, I think, earlier. Um, the contract pricing, as you can see, it's an organic summary. It'll cover at the farm gate, it'll cover contracted prices. There's about four or five pages, so you gotta kinda wade through that and um, figure out which one would be your page where it concerns on the farm pricing. And that's typically a spot contract or farm gate pricing on that. But uh, that's it's called the uh, National Organic Grain and Feedstuffs. I believe there's a website down at the bottom there where you can access those uh, numbers. Keep in mind, uh, not so much any today as it used to be that those prices can be um, skewed a little. Uh, they've tried to combine states, I think, from like Nebraska, Dakotas, as far east as Indiana, um, into the Midwest price. 
So it's no secret as you move from the Midwest to the coast, the price goes up. Uh, what they're doing is deducting the price of freight from you guys' grain when you grow it here. So um, it's harder to get a $10 price than it is for somebody in Ohio. <coughs> so that's uh, farm gate price on corn. You can see the five-year average is in the dotted red. You can see some of those highs I mentioned. Uh, that's the 2017 price on the uh, the dark, heavy black line. Similar thing for soybeans. Um, you can see some of those events, how it affected the price on the Midwest grain. And there's always been a split between the value of organic grain and conventional grain. The old rule of thumb back in the early days was it should be worth twice of what conventional is. You don't hear that it as much anymore. You still hear it from time to time. Um, but uh, we've kind of pretty much developed our own market in terms of pricing that isn't as dependent on the board of trade or what's happening on the conventional side of grains. Um, and then that's for organic soybeans versus conventional. So again, you can see that spread. What has made so many people consider transferring or transitioning into organics is the potential for a better farm family income. Um, a lot of them have gone from being just supporting my family to mom, now my son or daughter can come into the farm and we can both earn a reasonable living. Um, that's what makes it so enticing to a lot of people is that it can support more than one family if it's got enough acres and if it's done properly. So how can I access these markets? Of course, attend a marketing program such as this. A lot of the states have organic trade shows. Uh, they have a lot of breakout sessions as we do here on a variety of topics. And uh, those are just some of them. The Moses Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, they tout it as the granddaddy of them all. So there's a a, ver a variation in the number of people attending and what have you, but typically they're all very well run, some very informative um, breakout sessions. So what are the challenges for organic grain growers? Uh, the s lot smaller or lower number of handling facilities. Because of this, I always encourage on-farm storage. Um, it costs you money, yes, but so does having to find a facility that maybe can help you dry your grain, store your grain, um, that type of thing. And most buyers, I would say the vast majority, want that grain delivered to them in the proper moisture content and as we talked about cleanliness and that type of thing. Um, the processing capacity, while it's growing at all the time, is still much, much smaller as compared to conventionally. Um, and like I said, typically, if they have storage, you have to ensure your product is coming in there in the proper condition because they will not put it in their 50 to who knows how large a bins, 150, 200,000 bushel bin, if it's in a condition that will jeopardize their product they've already put in there. So farmer-owned cooperatives are a good place to, uh, you know, check or see if there's something in your area. Organic Valley is a large um, farmer-owned cooperative based in Lafarge, Wisconsin. Um, they are involved 
like NF Organics in assisting farmers are buying milk, grain, and meats. Um, we have divisions. I handle the organic grain. We have a conventional grain division. We have a milk division, and we have a uh, meat marketing, mostly conventional. So any grain companies or elevators? Are there feed mills in your area that maybe fix up or mix up uh, animal rations? Um, any feed lots that are involved or big barns uh, laying facilities for organic hens. Um, processors and of course bro brokers, buyers or marketing agents such as myself. But I do not take possession, I do not buy grain. I market grain and you'll find that with a lot of your farmer based cooperatives, they are marketers. They don't buy your grain, they help you sell your grain. So, um, so there is a lot of problems on the conventional side of the egg equation. Um, I was just talking with a young producer of mine from central Minnesota. He had mentioned how a couple of his neighbors had gone out of business on the conventional side. And these were not small farmers. These were three to 5,000 acre farmers that because of the low prices on corn and soybeans, the high price of land costs and equipment, they're no longer in business. And there sits the bank with land that was worth $10,000 three, four years ago, now might sell for $6,500 an acre. So, um, but one of the questions we have to consider and I think be very careful about is how do we, in an orderly manner, transition all of these acres into the organic market? Uh, we don't want to risk the collapse of the system as a whole due to too large or too fast of uh, enlargement in the organic community. Um, we have to continue to get consumers to conscientiously buy more organic food, but even before they buy it, I think there needs to be a much greater um, program or process that we make the consumer knowledgeable. They have so many buzzwords throwing at them of non-GMO or you know organic and what's the difference. So there still needs to be a whole bunch of education of our consumers in order to grow this process. Um, but it is something that is continues to grow in a, a worldwide global. Um, they wanted to know what people were most concerned with when buying organic products and they cited the country of origin. Now, as you all know, the last couple of years uh, we've tried to get that instilled in the U.S. and it's been shot down. So it isn't just people in the U.S., which is the largest organic market in the world. It's worldwide that people want to know um, what country did this come from. So in helping my people, um, not only planning, I have a lot of my producers, you know, what should I plant next year? Uh, what crops do you see is either maintaining their pricing or, you know, getting a better price than what I typically would raise? So we have a lot of conversations about rotations. Uh, what crops, you know, are good or which ones should I maybe um, plant fewer acres of and not necessarily get out of. But in working through Old Farm, um, we have a conference call every two weeks between myself and the other marketers. So I know pretty much on a national scale what's going on in pricing of organic grains. Um, we know which buyers are doing a good job and maybe which are someone to uh, be cautious of. And we also cooperate with each other. If I have the grain but they have the contract, we fill the contract. We work for our farmers to get that done and to do it in a manner where it doesn't cost you, the producer, anymore. We take less. We share that five and a half percent or whatever to get the. Um, so it gives us a lot larger area of uh, cooperation 
and helping the farmer that way. And of course we, uh, as I mentioned, handle your logistic needs on that. And I think most every one of us do that in that uh, old farm structure. So hopefully you'll profit more. Um, of course we monitor pricing, have market intelligence for a much larger area of the grain belt here, who's buying grain, and uh, make sure that you get paid in a timely manner. Um, so I've got time for questions. Is there anything you had any questions on? or would like to me expound upon. Yes, sir. Is the imports of organic products, uh, the testing of those and entering the U.S. markets, are they really solid or, you know, like you say, people want to know, well, this is the farm I'm getting my food from, but when you get them from India, who knows? And my question is, is there anything that we can do to protect the American? Organic integrity is a, a big a question, Tim? Oh, yeah. Okay, the question was, is there enough scrutiny? Is there enough testing? Is there enough uh, structure and what have you within the USDA to ensure that these imports uh, are, in fact, meeting the organic standards that you people have to do? Unfortunately, the answer to that is no or not always, <laughs> or not as well as it should be. Whoops, what did I go? Um, Old Farm has been one of the organizations that has been involved in spearheading, urging the USDA to do a better job of ensuring this. And I could probably go on for another hour, and in fact, uh, we'll be speaking at the uh, OCIA certifying agencies national convention, not only on marketing, but on that very subject. So um, there has been an inspector general, um, what do I want to say, investigation of the NOP and the USDA. And I think I've got a copy of that with me. I'm over in the corner over here. Um, but they showed about five different areas in which the NOP has failed to protect the organic integrity uh, well enough um, and has given them directives to do so, uh, cooperating with other agencies that are involved at the port because the NOP didn't go to the port with their inspectors. So, um, and they've given them though until I think it's June of this year to improve upon their process uh, if you've watched the news lately, there's been some talk of additional funding in the Farm Bill for organics and protecting the integrity of the organic seal. Hopefully that comes through and they're able to in the defense of NOP. There's, I forget, I think each inspector had like 2.5 billion bushels of grain that they were responsible for. They're just overwhelming. but. That said, there were also holes in the process that need to be sealed. Other questions? Yes, sir. Question for you. We all know that organic soybeans and corn, we have a market for that. And uh, a lot of us are trying to get away from alcohol. We don't have the animals to support the hay. So what are you seeing three, five years out? Not beans, not corn for those off years, because very few of us do have to use corn bean rotation. It just doesn't work. Very it doesn't well. work organically. So the question is, uh, you know, alfalfa or some other legume is a great part of a rotation, uh, but if you don't have your own animals to put that through, uh, where, where do we go with it? Uh, it's a somewhat limited market. Um, the last two and a half years, I haven't sold much for hay. I used to sell a lot. Well, what's the reason for that? Well, there's been a lot of hay, um, and it has um, really overfilled the market with alfalfa. Um, and so I've had producers that have gone to be large alfalfa growers to the point where after a poor year or a year or so ago, he told me he was going to take 165 RFE hay, grind it up and put it back out there as fertilizer. So you still need to, I think, have some type of legume in your 
in your rotation, but maybe to a lesser degree. Well, a lot of guys like rye. Well, what happens if everybody make, lets it go to harvest instead of crimping it and planting into it? There's a glut of rye right now. I had 20, 25,000 bushels last fall and couldn't find a market anywhere in the U.S. for it. Uh, I finally sold a couple of bushels as uh, dairy feed, but your buyer has to have a hammer mill to turn that into powder to get the nutritive value out of it. If you only roller mill it, 35-40 percent is going to pass right through the cow. So uh, these are all things that you have to think about before you plan that rotation. Uh, Charlie Johnson, I mentioned, I think has a five-year rotation. Corn, alfalfa, oats, and so, corn, soybean, alfalfa, oats. And, but he has a 200 cow beef herd that he can feed his alfalfa to. So you have to think that through. What other grains could you produce? There's always a very, quite a strong market for organic food grade wheat. Um, hard red spring seems to be the most in demand, at least in my area, although from here east, it's probably soft red winter wheat. So wheat market is typically pretty strong. Uh, feed market is uh, strong in terms of demand, but it's a little low on the price when you consider $14 feed wheat to $7 feed. Uh, typically, it's not that far apart. The pulses, any of the pulses, peas, uh, lentils, chickpeas, cow peas, um, I think are up and coming things as alternate protein sources that a lot of people are looking at with uh, you know, gluten free and all of this. Um, I, I'm selling peas in place of soybeans into mills uh, because the people, rate these small farmers that have hogs or chickens want some other type of grain other than a soybean based grain. So um, I say don't ever get totally away from your rotation, but you might have to tweak it a little bit given what the market is doing. What about oats? Oats is a pretty good product, not as good as it used to be. The unfortunate side of the oat market is typically there's one buyer on the food grade side. So there's a glut of oats. Back when corn was $12, I could sell oats all day long to the dairy farmers because corn prices were too high, so they reverted back to using barley and oats. Well, with low corn prices now, struggling to break $8, they aren't switching back. So that has uh, decimated the feed market. Um, so once again, don't get away from oats, but maybe plant some other. Diversity is the, the secret, and if you can have a number of small bins instead of one large one or what have you. This is going to help you immensely in your diversification of what you grow in your rotation. And that's why we urge so much, always have your eyes open for used bins. Uh, hopefully with drying ability or you have a dryer to make sure it's properly dried. Just a quick aside, uh, not this winter so far, but a year ago. Had a lot of people with wheat, and they put it to bed, it was right. It was 10, 11, 12 percent. Came time to sell it, and it was 14 and 15 percent. Well, what happened? They didn't monitor it. Last year was very up and down in temperatures. So there was probably condensation going on in that bin that caused it to absorb moisture. So it's a, a situation where you have to constantly put a lot more attention into keeping that grain in condition so that you're sure it's ready to sell. Uh, you know, you can be going along fine in a bin and then all of a sudden you hit a moldy or musty spot. Well, if you're selling food grade product, it isn't going to be food grade product. Yes, sir? You talked about imports. What about export potential? Well, there's always some. Um, so it's, Okay, uh, he said, I talked about imports, but what's the export potential? In the U.S., if you look at the USDA's reports, uh, I think they come out probably monthly, um, of the top 10 products, organic products being exported, uh, corn and soybeans are in there, but they aren't 
you know, necessarily the highest ones. There used to be a very excellent uh, market to the Asian rim, if you will, uh, but even that has been um, clouded by other countries. I'll give you an example of a buyer I work with told me his brother was over, I don't know, Taiwan or somewhere trying to sell U.S. food grade beans. And he asked the buyer what the price was. He was told 1850. He said, I can't buy feed grade beans for 1850. And the answer was, if you can't provide it, the Ukraine can. So it's a world market and it's become tougher to sell overseas. Not say you can't, but it isn't as easy as it used to be. Yes, sir. Farmer is selling grain to another farmer. Who, who pays the grain? Well, I think uh, that should be paid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting. The question was, if you're selling to another farmer, who pays the freight? And in my opinion, that's part of the cost of the grain. Now, it depends upon your relationship with that farmer, but I think the one who wants it should pay the freight. But if it's someone you've dealt with, you're somewhat friendly, maybe you negotiate, you know, we each pay some of the freight. But that is part of the cost of grain is uh, either the marketing and or the cost of freight to get it there. And I mean, if it's right close by, that's one thing. But if you're driving 100 miles, you don't do that for nothing. Over here. Look how fast this organic milk field turned. Right. Uh, we are so, being an organic farmer, we are so uh, patterned after the consumer. And this organic milk we've been built up, I don't, I sell, I don't dairy, but I follow the organic milk field. But look how fast that was built up. Look how fast it got pulled down. The question or we really have to watch that is it's because we're so far, you know, easily patterned what the consumer wants. Right. So it's, it's very, <coughs> it can change like that. Yes, and uh, there is, the question or comment was, uh, look how fast the milk industry has changed. We've gone from uh, probably being, 26. yeah, uh, from a market that was probably well over $30 a hundredweight for, um, and considerably over if you had good premiums on your uh, butter fat and some of those other things they test, um, to a situ, and it wouldn't take you too long to get on the truck to get your milk to market. And uh, now this last six months, we've gone to a point where there is an overproduction of organic milk. A lot of farmers I used to sell grains to may have lost their contract completely. Um, you know, it's forcing people to make decisions. Do I stay in dairy on the conventional side or do I get out of the uh, industry altogether, and so yes, it changed very quickly. Um, either reduction in the price per hundred weight, uh, or you can add additional milk, or you're on a quota. We'll pay you organically for this many hundred weights, but if you produce above that, you're getting paid a conventional price on that milk. So um, this heat rapid expansion has had its. Uh, its uh, effects on the organic market, by all means. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the marketing of transitional products? Yes, good point. Um, the question is, can I speak briefly on transitional grain? And uh, it's something that, of course, is very concerning for someone going from conventional into organic, those three years of transitioning your ground to the organic side of the equation here. And it's a constant question for me. Can you help me with my transitional grains? And my answer is, well, yes, but. <laughs> um, plan as if you're going to get conventional prices. There's a lot of talk about non-GMO in the marketing side of all this, um, you know, non-GMO, organic, and all these marketing buzzwords get kicked around. And it is great for the sale on their side, but how does it affect you as a, a farm family? 
And the problem is, is there's far more grain in the transitional and the non-GMO market than there is currently market for. So I always instruct my people, plan as if you're going to be paid conventionally and or maybe you're going to get the non-GMO premium. Um, I'm able to help some of them. I have some small niche markets, certain feed mill, a certain farm that buys transitional grain that understands the difference between transitional grain and non-GMO grain, but it is a very, very tiny market. So, um, you know, your banker is going to be very interested in your process here. So plan like your conventional or, or slightly above. Hope that you can find markets that give you a premium, but don't expect that they're just there waiting to be had. Yes, sir. My previous question about uh, foreign imports of organic, quote unquote, organic yes. products. Uh -huh. When talking to Washington, would what's the process? Would we talk to our representative about shoring up the protection of the American farm markets, organic markets, or is that something that's done at the U.S. Who, who, where would we go? Okay, the, the question is what is the process or how can I help uh, to ensure that the imports and even domestic production is being done according to the USDA's NOP standards. And not all imports are fraudulent, but I think you can trust pretty much the European Union, Canada, uh, you know, they, we have these reciprocity and, and uh, agreements with certain countries and I guess what baffles me is it's a list of only about eight and the uh, there's a lot of product coming in from countries that we supposedly don't have an agreement with well how is that happening um, so there's still a lot of things that need to be looked at to answer or we need to keep prodding the, the bear as it were but yes any help you can give on the state level, most of your uh, congressional and senate people have an egg egg representative person in their office, so you can start at that level. Also, then any of them are on the national scene in Washington. You need to contact their office and say, you know, who's who's responsible for your egg policy, and let them know that hey, there, there needs to be some things fixed here, and uh, I'm a concerned constituent who would like to see some attention given to this. Yes, sir. Is that going to be enough, or do we need to look at a class action lawsuit against the USDA and NLP for the loss of equity to the producers in this room? The question is, is that going to be enough? Or should we consider a class action lawsuit uh, for loss of uh, income and equity uh, against USDA and NOP? Uh, it probably isn't enough because I guess I always profess don't expect Washington or legislators to fix our problems. We've got to do it ourselves. Uh, that said, it's a good place to start, but there needs to be maybe something additionally beyond that. Uh, that we ensure that you know this is being done and is protecting our interests. Um, just to give you an example though, of the idiocy, I guess, of part of this, our agreement with India is tied to a nuclear non-proliferation treaty, is my understanding. You'd probably have to be the president to check on whether or not that program is being run properly. I believe the Indian government certifies the farmers and you've got to have a very, very, very high security clearance to even be able to check on it. So I don't think anybody, probably at the NOP, I don't know if anybody has it. So these are some of the things that we found out in trying to get this thing looked at over the past two years and it's, it's a nightmare. We've won a few battles, we've stopped a few shipments, but the war continues. Ma'am? You mentioned how we need to try to persuade the consumer to look at our bags more seriously. Uh -huh. I went on the USDA website and I connect up with a weekly release of recalled food products. 
and I put that on my Facebook. And I and then as I'm in my own little world, I talk to people. And I say, oh, by the way, did you know this was recalled? Well, the brochure didn't pull it. No. It's a buyer beware. Just right. recently pepperoni sticks, uh, sprouts, um, don't know sprouts, salmonella poison. Uh, just and they're shocked by the amount of recall that comes out every week that the common consumer is not informed. So I go that way. Right. Tell them why they don't want to continue buying straight off the grocery shelf. Unless it's organic. Was everybody able to hear that? The uh, crux of what she was talking about is what she's doing as an individual. Uh, going out onto the USDA site and checking on products that are subject to recall for whatever reason, that are labeled organically. And she puts that on her personal um, site, Facebook or whatever you have. You know, are you aware that these products are on recall status? Um, there is a site at the USDA where you can check on um, worldwide who is certified or who has had their organic certification rejected. And uh, it's https colon double black slash organic dot ams dot usda dot gov dot slash integrity. So you can check on anybody worldwide and see if they still hold their organic certification and who has been uh, had their certification pulled and why. I think there's uh, something like 41,000 records and 2,600 and some pages. So. We've got time for two more questions. Two more questions, ma'am in the back. Um, so uh, I have heard that many of the buyers are now asking for domestically produced. So right here in the United States, we use more organic corn and soybeans than we produce. So this is why we have you here, is let's supply our own market. Why are, but I, I, I think you have some numbers on this. It's something like 60% of the organic corn that is being fed to organic livestock <coughs> in the United States is coming from outside the country. Right. Uh, but I do know that many of the brokers and buyers would prefer domestic, and of course that would go back to the consumer too, and I think the, the livestock operators, they want organic feed. So if they knew that it was domestically produced, I think that's another way to lessen the, the cheaper uh, uh, imports, is just don't give them our market. Very good. Thanks, Harriet. One more, back here. Uh, question on grass-fed. Are you seeing any uh, movement with the grass-fed uh, livestock market impacting the price of the The question is, um, grass-fed um, animals, mostly beef, but I guess you can consider poultry that's out and grazing or what have you. Has uh, that grown and is it impacting pricing? Um, it has grown. Um, it isn't an area I get real involved in uh, because I concentrate mainly on grain. It is something you really have to look hard for a specialty buyer. Uh, it works well if you're smaller scale and you're working with a garden club or a CSA or someone like that. On a large scale, I dabbled in organic beef for a couple of years and it's a very, very, and I was small by our farm size numbers with a couple hundred head, but it's a very fickle and a very difficult market to break into. I don't know that that's improved a lot. As an organization, we don't deal in it because it is pretty small scale. The question was though, with the would, with the growth, albeit maybe it's too small in that market, uh -huh. does that lower the demand and price of the grain? So more from the grain side of things? Is the it could. Uh, I don't think it has. Will it in the future? Will the cost or will the, uh, not just in grain or grass fed, but any uh, meat product being fed something other than grains, it has not affected it yet. Could it in the future? 
if the surge becomes large enough, yes, good. So. All right. We should transition to the next speaker. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you.